Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show, the Paleo Post Podcast. On this episode, Genevieve and I will be reviewing some of the most important, influential, and exciting topics relating to paleoanthropology and anthropology at large. Each week, we will be going on air to help teach and educate science as it is being done. So get ready, because your Paleo Post is incoming. Woohoo! Here we are again! Yes, I know. <laughs> I... I know I say this literally every time. I know, but I am so excited for this episode. I know, I know. Well, in this time, we actually had to choose. There was so much. There was it's such true. an abundance of riches. It's true. We had to decide which article to kick to next week. We so. actually did have to kick an article this time, which is a first. Um, yeah. Which is just amazing. great. And this week we have yep. two bioant stories, which I think you guys have probably caught on that I kind of like bioant a bit. I might be a little biased towards it. Um, so I'm very excited about that because we're going to be talking Neanderthals and genetics. And then we're going to be talking, well, not then, it's not in that order, but we will also be talking about this really interesting art piece that uh, Genevieve found. Yeah. And uh, she will be taking the lead on that one because, well, you know, she's the art person. It's the paleo art stuff. Well, it's like it's a bio ant sandwich with, it is. with, with paleo art filling. <laughs> with paleo art filling. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, that just sounds delicious to me. I know it does. So it does. So because I think you know, we've got a good deal of info to cover, I say oh, yeah. we jump right in and Let's take a big bite out of this uh, paleo art sandwich. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nicely done. <laughs> so the first story that we'll be talking about, as I mentioned, involves Neanderthals. Um, mm-hmm. Specifically, it is involving Shanadar Cave. Uh, and the flower burial associated with Shanadar 4. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head. Shanadar is in Iraq, correct? Yes, it's in the okay. north part of Iraq in Kurdistan territory. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So... The reason that this site is significant is for a multitude of reasons. First of all, not only were Neanderthal artifacts found in a 1970s invest, uh, excavation, but mm-hmm. so were various remains, as well as multiple burials. I mean, this might have happened earlier, but it, during this excavation period, what we're going to be focusing on, say, is 1971 reports by Solecki talking about Shanadar 4 involving what we all might know as the flower burial. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, Shanadar is like the cave that keeps on giving. There's so much cool stuff there. But yeah, I think it's probably almost, I would say almost most famous for the flower burial, just because of the timing at the end of the 60s and the flower power era. Like, that was my understanding. Was it really kind of caught the zeitgeist too? Like, oh, Neanderthals are hippies too, right? Love and peace everywhere. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, you know, if that's how they want to associate it, they yeah. can they can but why not, <laughs> why not? but yeah. so what this was believed to have been and i so just to make this a little more clear yeah this is a cave that there are multiple neanderthal burials throughout mm, it's not a super thick layer. I mean, they're all somewhat in the same time period. There's really not a diverse population over a period of time that's using this cave. It was more more at the same time. Um, but there are Neanderthal burials, which that alone shows a level of cultural and behavioral sophistication that yeah. we assumed no species besides modern contemporary uh, homo sapiens were capable of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I think, and then that's what we have to remember too. Is of course we're looking back now from the 21st century with the eyeglasses of oh, well, we've got Neanderthals doing all of these things, right? Like I just did a short 
uh, answer video, a couple people had asked me about like artifacts for Neanderthals, and I was able to talk about like them selecting black feathers specifically, and like using eagle talons and making necklaces. So now we're kind of looking or, or using ochre, right? So like lots of like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, we've got we've got stuff. But back in the early seventies, that was like a big challenge to the the neanderthals being kind of like the you know sort of dumb like sort of slow you know slow as a slack jawed <laughs> you right, know sort of like right. like that very traditional neanderthal this was like and i think this was a big deal uh, am i not correct i think this was one of the big ones that really started the conversation of are they capable of empathy of higher levels of thought what does it mean if they were burying their dead Absolutely. It really was a pivotal moment, I think, yeah. in Neanderthal archaeology, where yeah. people had to stop and go, okay, um, this shouldn't be, according to our hypotheses, exist. Yeah. We need yeah. to rethink how we're viewing potential cultures beyond our own. Yeah. Our so own being all of modern humans yes yeah like not just our, our little narrow version but maybe the broader sense um also i think were they saying correct me if i'm wrong but i believe a lot of the pollen was found under well, we haven't gone there yet we haven't oh, gone oh, there yet pardon we me. Gone okay. there yet. yeah we haven't gone there yet okay okay okay, okay. so <laughs> that's all right so, so spoiler alert well, i know <laughs> so what has been spectacular about shanadar yeah. Is Shannadar 4 in particular. Yeah. And that is because, and the reason that this burial got the name the flower burial is because around the grave, kind of literally around the perimeter of the body, mm -hmm. there's pollen of various plants. And, you know, in the 70s, mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry, tree there you go uh, <laughs> I'd say was, that one. <laughs> yeah yeah was you know not as advanced or yeah if it existed at all I don't, i'm not sure yeah. um but you know i don't we telling what the pollen was was not really the easiest thing if possible at all no and so it was just assumed by Selecki in the 70s that it was Neanderthals that had actually placed flowers in the ground or on the ground and then placed their family member, this individual, whoever this may have been, on top of the flowers and then laid dirt upon them and then they decomposed all together and we have this grave. Yeah. Which shows a level even beyond that. I mean, calling that a grave good is not, is a stretch in my opinion. That's a stretch, but yeah, yeah, it's something. It, it, well, it is something. Okay. Well, I think a grave good, the idea of the grave goods, they're often meant to, I mean, they seem to fall in specific categories like food for right. somebody to take with them or some sort of valuable item or some right. sort of beautiful item. Like, like there's usually sort of categories, but the idea of flowers is at the same time, if it's true, I mean, there's a level of aesthetic appreciation there, which is very Absolutely. intriguing. And, you know, I think to me that that's always was the thing that when I was learning about it, when I was back in my undergrad days, right? Like sort of like, that was sort of what was brought up was that idea that yeah, flowers is like a whole different thing. And then it's like, well, do Neanderthals think flowers are pretty too? Do they soft to stop to sniff the flowers? Like it's a whole, right. a whole thing, right? Right. Absolutely. So there were a lot of proposed hypotheses for why they were there yep. from, they just happened to be there to, they had blown in to, they were there to get rid of the smell yep. to, I mean, a lot of people did not like this idea. And for good reason. It was very yeah. controversial. It was brand new. Yeah. And it has been controversial to this day. Yeah. So over the week, this last week, a new paper came out detailing new information that we were able to gain from the pollen um, yeah. using poly... Uh, 
polynological evidence okay. from Shanadar 4, and what they were able to determine is what the plants were and when they flowered. And Ooh, what this showed good. is that it was not possible that the plants were gathered at the same time. Yeah. So, I mean... That's an interesting point because you can't time travel. So if so, basically, what what the article was saying, just to make sure it's making sense for everybody, was that like for instance, say this flower blooms in April, this one blooms in September. So they couldn't, they wouldn't have been in flower at the same time, and therefore able to both be put into a grave simultaneously. That's basically the argument they're making back now, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. And. Um, so what this means is that it's pretty difficult to say that this was done intentionally. And what they yeah. think was the culprit is actually bees or some other pollinating insect, but most likely bees that tunneled in, not tunneled, flew in, geez, flew in yeah. and went in. And just, you know, bees, when they go around, pollen falls off of them. Yeah. And they think that could have been something, that this was a home for local bees for a while, obviously, for this yeah. to accumulate. Now, I saw a lot of people, uh, well, no one who researches anthropology. But I saw a lot of people who may be enthusiastic or fans of paleoanthropology mm -hmm. saying, well, you know, the flower burials being thrown out, I guess Neanderthals may not be as intelligent as we thought. They may not have done the things we thought they were capable of doing. Mm -hmm. And I got a few problems with this. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, let me just dust off my soapbox. <laughs> right, let me just, okay. Standing on it now, okay? Yeah, totally. All right, so, first of all, <laughs> no. But, so, the paper goes on to say that this does not get rid of the potential that flowers that could have been collected mm -hmm. could have been placed upon the grave when it was, the Neanderthal was buried. Instead of the flowers oh. being gathered and put on the bottom at the time as like a fresh flower bed, which is what mm -hmm, they were thinking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Instead, it could have been various plants or flowers that were placed or added later. Like the way that we the, grave. the way we take flowers exactly. to graves nowadays and like exactly. put them in vases or whatever, like at a loved one's like sort of gravesite. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Well that's a whole different idea, isn't it? Right. And now, beyond that, I would like everyone to also remember that we have quite a lot of other cultural artifacts from Neanderthals that show their oh, yeah. level, their high level of cultural abilities, such as cave art, such as yeah, I what they weren't there. What was it? They found those circular. Structures. Oh, well, there's that's in Brunacel in France. Yeah, it's like 180,000 years old, I believe. 182,000, yeah. if I remember. And they were creating circular structures like deep underground by breaking off stalactites, uh -huh. stalagmites, yeah. and, and arranging them in a way that makes no sense for any real practical purpose. So, I mean, I think, well, like I just was saying before, too, um, we can even link it. Like that video I just did for so a QA where, like, I mean, there's really good broad evidence across a big chunk of Europe that Neanderthals were selecting parts of birds that don't really have any meat, like the edge, the ends of the wings and stuff, like where you would not, you wouldn't eat that. And they appear to have been cutting the feathers off, like taking the feathers off of them. And it's almost all raptors and corvids. So raptors mm -hmm. and, and raven crowbirds, which suggests they liked black feathers, which I mean, right. is 
like there is no practical reason to like black feathers. Like like that is so <laughs> so much like an asymbolic. Are you saying it's not practical to be goth, Genevieve? Oh, I'm all about that goth. I love that. I was like, maybe this is where the goth movement started. I love the idea <laughs> of goth Neanderthal. It'd be so funny. Um, but you know, like the, like there's no. There would be no purpose to so carefully picking only black feathers if they didn't have some symbolic purpose to them. Like, I mean, th there's so many things now that we have with Neanderthal. And I mean, the jewelry, like we've got great right. examples of jewelry. Um, there's a, I mean, I've, I've been in the Santander Museum a few times now. And like, like there's a little portable piece in there, which has like a row of four engraved cupels across it with another cupel underneath it. Like, um, I think one of my friends wrote about it a few years ago for her dissertation, but it was like, like, those are not, and that's, that's from a Neanderthal layer, I think it's about 70,000 or so. So, I mean, again, no, there's no humans in the vicinity. Um, and then there's Ardales, Maltravieso, La Pasiaga, possibly others in the future, you know, so it's like, there, those are cave art sites, uh, and so you know. I mean, yeah, we're it's such a different landscape now that it's just more a like just a second. Okay, it's her. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I think you know, building on what you're saying, though, where it's like, okay, so the situation in the 1970s, the flower burials was almost like an anomaly, right? Whereas now, as you were just saying, we have so much evidence of Neanderthals doing symbolic cultural things that were like, we've just, we've kind of, I, I think whether they did flower burials or not at this point, it, it doesn't, it's almost like a moot point. Like it's, it's, it, it would be like, Oh, that's so cute that they were doing that. But I mean, we don't have evidence of modern humans flower burials either at this point um right. again it doesn't mean they were leaving flowers um because i think one of the things i wanted to flag for me when i was reading this article which a made me laugh was <laughs> did you notice that they called um because you know, again for the listeners no not slamming anybody who came before us we stand on the shoulders of all these giants in the field but the techniques we're able to use now for doing archaeology have massively changed right. we're also you know we're so incredibly careful now when it comes to how we excavate sites but did you notice they use the term excavation hygiene i did not i but... giggled i was like best term ever so what they meant by that was the idea is is that back in the day um you know, there's also the possibility that the people who are working at the site may have clumped in some pollen on their boots, right? Or right, like they right. had on their clothes or like, so I love that fact that we're, yeah, our excavation hygiene now is really high. Like we're really careful <laughs> we're exactly. at sites about, are we shedding DNA or are we doing things to it to accidentally contaminate it? Whereas early seventies, they, they were aware, but they weren't thinking about it maybe with quite the level of precision we were like we do now. So, you know, but like, I think one of the big interesting things that is sort of a good takeaway from this is also the idea that the, the term, so taphonomy or taphonomic processes, um, for anybody who doesn't know what that is, it refers to the idea that after something has been buried or covered up, that things happen after the fact that could alter it. And so in this case, what they were saying was that either, rodents could have buried, dug their way in and um if they if they digging down into the dirt they could have brought say pollen down with them so they're they're changing the layers the layers aren't necessarily like intact um and so as opposed and so these are the things you have to be really careful of is you know you have to not only do the excavation but you almost have to be like forensic and like trying to rebuild like is there any contamination not just from humans but is there any evidence of like um you know basically insects like bees or rodents right. or like other things that could have exactly. or, or water flowing through a site right like anything that could have disturbed it and therefore messed up those layers or and slip some things in there that don't belong there it does it happens all the time oh i mean it completely happens it's, yeah. it probably happens more often than not oh yeah yeah and you're you're lucky if it's something super obvious like 
oh, how did this piece of pottery get down here? Like, you know what I mean? Like, you're like, we know this came from, like, the Roman era. <laughs> right, <laughs> and if, yeah, if it's yeah. down here, something dug its way down, or, like, something happened. Yeah, it's, like, like It's not ancient aliens, people. No, it's, no. Like, there, there are like, reasons. Yes, yeah, there wasn't some sort of time-traveling Roman. <laughs> 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 so, you know, like, so, I mean, these things happen, and I think now we're just, there's... There's so much, like, care is just taken. I think there's just much deeper understanding now of how to be very careful when excavating that just didn't exist. And I would say by the 70s standards, they were being really careful. Yeah. Like, I got the sense that they were being really careful. Um, I mean, it depends yeah. on where you are. I mean, they were yeah. still blasting... Uh dynamite in some areas i feel why, but why yes they were so yes yes <laughs> but, but, the, but the particular activation at shanadar i feel like those yeah, guys yeah. did a pretty good job yeah. though hey yeah. like that, that was your impression too like i feel like they yeah. were really they were trying they were and i know from talking to dr emma pomeroy who was very yes. involved uh yep. on the excavations may still be i'm not sure um but she said that they're extremely meticulously good notes on yeah, everything. That's what I've heard too. And so, I mean, this is the thing is that you do get people who are trying really hard. They just didn't necessarily, as you said, they didn't have all the mass spectrometry. They didn't have right. all, you know, I mean, the seventies to now is a while, you know, it's been a hot yeah. minute. We may have learned a thing or two in the meantime. <laughs> Seriously. Absolutely. Science yeah. advances faster than anything else. <laughs> That's what makes it so fun. So, right. well, and on that note, I have to. I'm going to drag us over to talk about the the paleo art filling in our sandwich today, because <laughs> um, this is speaking of things happening. Um, this one really caught my interest in a number of different levels. So, the really brief thing is that in South Africa. Um, where, of course, we've got, you know, sites like, so, of course, there's, there's sites like Rising Star, which are much older. There's more also quite a concentration, though, of more recent sites that are associated with Homo sapien, like with our own direct ancestors. And um, so these are sites like Blombos and Pinnacle Point and um, Classy's Rivermouth, just to name a few. And these are often associated with what's called, like, Middle Paleolithic. So older than 50-ish, 60-ish thousand, sort of in that middle range, not quite not quite doing necessarily like quote unquote fully modern things in the sense of like, we're not necessarily finding art or things like that there, but maybe it's cause we're not looking in the right spots. And that's a perfect example here. Um, so they've been, they've been really doing some great research down there in recent years. Um, there's an ad, the African center for coastal paleo science is where this research comes out of. And um, so they're interested in everything to do with what the coast would have looked like during paleo times. And in this right. case, um, one of the first things I believe they found was a solidified footprint in a sand flat that hardened 150,000 years ago. First of all, how wild is that? Hey, every time I find, crazy. I find anytime I find footprints that, you know, like on a beach, I'm always like, what are the odds that that footprint stayed intact? Right? Like, like, if you, if, like, well, random, but not random. It does involve footprints. And I yeah. just want to, you know, footprints. Yep. While we're talking about footprints, because footprints are just so cool. They are so cool. And this is where, I mean, this is a podcast. It's always going to be a podcast. So yeah. you guys are just going to have to Imagine. listen. But I got this guy. <laughs> and what we're looking oh, at. You got a cast. That's yeah. right. Yay. We're looking at a cast, Genevieve and I, right now, yep. that I was thankfully given by Dr. Jeremy DeSilva of Aww. the um, uh, Laetoli footprint. And <laughs> and the Laetoli footprints are 3.3 million year old homo... Wild? Homo, jeez. Australopithecus afrensis footprints that were made in yep. volcanic ash in... Yeah, Tanzania or Kenya. I feel like it's Tanzania, but I could. I be think wrong. it's Tanzania. I think it's Tanzania. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but, but just yeah. what are the odds? Like footprints, I know. Are, and they're so personal because it's like, they and are. especially people are able to be like, this is from an adult, this is from a child walking beside an adult, this is likely female, male. Like it's so cool. Like this person had a limp. <laughs> like it's wild. It what absolutely you is. Like out yeah. of all my three D prints, this one yeah. is my favorite. Oh, I felt I love that. something I never did before when I looked at this one because it is so personal. Yeah. Uh, just 
to explain a little bit more about footprints um, when they fossilize, they're not called just fossils, right? No. They're called trace fossils. Yeah. Well, there's nothing actually that got preserved. It's exactly. The, it's the indent of, a, of something that used to be there that got preserved. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So trace fossils are behaviors that fossilize yes. practically. Yeah. Oh, and that's a really that, good way to put it. I yes. Like that. Yes. Yeah. So, like, we have dinosaur trace fossils of, like, their tails yeah. moving through the sand and, That's like, so things cool. like that. But yeah. so the fact that they found, what did you say, 128,000? 125? 150,000. 150,000. Wow. Yes. Well, this fits so well, though. Okay, so this is right. I, I went and looked it up instantly. Um, but what. This is just around the corner. It's like the next bay over from Mossel Bay. And Mossel Bay is mm -hmm. where Pinnacle Point is. And Pinnacle oh. Point has research. Um, they've got some great sites there. I think is it like 9B, I think, is the big site. Or is it 13B? I'll have to look it up. But um, where they've got traces of like engineering with fire going back 150,000 right. years. Absolutely. They've got lots of evidence of them playing with like ochre and changing colors and things. Like there was definitely modern humans in that vicinity around that time so very smartly now they're looking in adjacent regions and in i mean it makes you wonder what will they find in the next bay right like it's wild so not only did they find this footprint though in the same part of this like solidified former sand flat the first thing they spotted was a perfect circle with a dot in the middle dating to 136,000. Is isn't that wild? Wow. Okay. So, so, so yeah. So so perfect circle dot in middle. Do you want me to tell you how they think it got made? It's pretty cool. Yes. How okay. how okay. do you make a perfect circle? A hundred and thirty six thousand. One hundred thirty six thousand. But yeah. so also that means people have been in this area for yes. at least twenty thousand years. Yeah, they think this was one of the refuge spots. It was like sort of based on the weather and the glaciation that this was one of the good areas at the time uh -huh. um all along that coast there and um so they think what it is is a forked stick right so think about like you know those, those cheap geometry compasses <laughs> do you remember yeah. those right think forked stick make a circle and so they think that was how they probably did it and in the same vicinity in recent years i think it was like 2018 they found that they've also now found are you ready for this hashtags They've found, okay, I'm grabbing my notes to make sure I don't miss anything. <laughs> um, grooves, ha like cross hatches, hashtags, parallel lines, and even a triangle. Oh, all, wow. all etched into the sand, which then solidified. And so, wow. isn't that nuts to think that, A, it's the same sort of geometric signs that we find in other spots, which is pretty cool. <laughs> geometric signs for the win. Um, right. and, uh, Absolutely. <laughs> but, so the, the main researcher, I think it was Charles Helm, and he was suggesting that this type of sand art should almost be given its own name. Right? Like he was sort of saying, because he said it could have been kids making it, didn't necessarily have to be like deep and meaningful, but um, he was suggesting it gives it its own name. Now, from my point of view, I was sort of thinking, and I was like, well, I think it depends on how you want to divide up the art. Because he was making the argument that um, paintings are pictographs and engravings are petroglyphs, you, you know, like so that you've got the pictoglyphs, petroglyphs, all that. So these could be some sort of like sand glyph, which I think they're calling an ammo glyph. Um, huh. But again, I, I think the question is, though, is that when you're finding the same stuff thematically, absolutely, this is adding a whole new technique to it. Right. But I don't think it's necessarily a new type of art. I'm intrigued, actually, by the parallels between places like Blombos that weren't that far up the coast, where we're also seeing, you know, hashtag style, you know, cross hatching on you know, pieces of ochre or not too far from there at Deep Kloof, right? Like there's lots of examples of almost a culture of non-figurative art down there. Um, but I, the other big thing to me is that, you know, gosh, back to taphonomy and taphonomic stuff, we've lost all the exterior art almost everywhere in the world. And I think this comes back to me when I see this as, you know, even they were even making works on the beach. Like these caves are such time capsules of like, you know, sort of almost just perfect conditions. And, you know, I'm imagining 
a landscape with so many more markings on it that just, again, they haven't survived because of weathering and other, other processes that have, you know, damaged and eroded them. But, you know, it's, it's fascinating to think that if they were making marks in sand, I wonder if they were doing anything with ochre or charcoal or a stone tool into anything slightly more permanent, like a rock wall. Absolutely. And I yeah. think that all brings up a great point that I, don't think a lot of people it's not that they don't realize it i just don't think they really take a second to think about it and yeah. what i'm talking about is i think cave art oh wow how amazing and rare that is yeah. how special it's like yes it is very special it yeah. is rare yeah. but it's because it's preserved yeah a cave if art in a cave is not going to typically face wind or water damage nope Exactly. Whereas if you just have a cliff face yeah. that's not in a canyon or something, it's going to be gone within a few decades. Yep. Oh, yeah, especially I mean, paint and stuff like yeah, that, right? Yeah, less than a few decades. Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, I think the fact that we even have any external art that survived for thousands of years blows my mind. Like at Coa Valley, for instance, in Portugal, right. or Siega Verde across there in Spain, um... There's, you know, here and there, I mean, the art in Australia is magnificent, like that some of it survived in these sort of overhang rock shelters. But, you know, yeah, the, the caves are not necessarily as unique as they seem. It's more likely that everything else has been damaged and lost. <laughs> As, right. as I think probably more what we're dealing with. And so for me, I always love catching glimpses of the possibilities of what the landscape probably looked like. So being in Portugal and Coa Valley was like that for me because the art is literally on these stone slabs that are just up on either side of where people lived. And that was kind of the big moment for me when I went, these are the same images we're seeing in the caves, but mm -hmm. these aren't like special or protected. Like, Anybody who lived here could look up and see these images. So maybe right. we're not thinking about this right if we're imagining secret societies where special people only got, you know, you know, like it's so absolutely those little moments that really kind of make you rethink it. And I think for me, that's what makes this story so magnificent is it never occurred to me. Like, that they might make marks on sand and it could survive yeah, yeah. for 136,000 years, which is wild. Um, is, yeah. And then suddenly, yeah, like I said, I'm like, well, wait, those are there's a lot of marks like that on, like, artifacts that have been found in the vicinity. I mean, man, I would love to go down there with some scanning equipment and look in some of those <laughs> caves. <laughs> Instantly, I was like, hmm, um, to see if we could find some of these same marks in a different format somewhere. Um, but to, to see, like, it's almost like we're starting to build up a bit of an inventory now or a typology of what type of marks had already been, you know, invented. I'm using air quotes because we don't know how old they truly are. But, they, right. you know, were, were being used by that time period is a pretty big challenge, too, to where, when... Who, what, how did art start, right? <laughs> I love it. Absolutely. That's a great story that way. But I mean, Absolutely. very preliminary at this point, stay tuned, but super intriguing possibility. And with that, um, we have our final story, which, as we mentioned, is the final piece of our sandwich here for today. <laughs> and <laughs> we're going to be talking about a genetic bottleneck and before oh, yeah. we do that let me briefly explain what a genetic bottleneck is yeah so basically when you have a population of a species you have a quote breeding population and yeah. that means individuals that are able to reproduce and you have within that population is able to reproduce a what we call a gene pool a group of a collection of all the possible genetic combinations that one can have phenotypically for that species. And a genetic bottleneck is when, if you imagine, let's say, a bottle of Coke. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the bottom, it's quite wide. But as you head towards the top, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And then it, it chokes off at a point before it gets wider again. And that is what a genetic bottleneck is, if it ever gets wider. Um, so the gene pool loses a large 
amount of its variability due yeah. to some reason. And the following generations lose, let's say, blue eyes are gone. There's yeah. no more blue eyes. Or let's say red hair is gone. Yeah. Or like or like double jointed thumbs or something. Yeah. Like it could be something anything. Like yeah. But if the person who had that dies, then they can't pass on that version of the thumb gene. Exactly. <laughs> Basically they're gone. Yeah. So they can be devastating to a yes. population. Yep. And our species is no stranger to them, although yep. they've been highly controversial because the only way for us to understand how they work is by looking through our genetics, yep. which is a very complicated thing to do. And it's controversial even at this point. Now, before I talk about this story, I want to briefly talk about a story that has had the same effect and they are kind of in the same place. And that is the Toba eruption. Theory. I made notes on that. Of course. Great. Why not? Uh, like do it. Perfect. Yes. Yep. So uh, 74,000 years ago, the earth experienced one of the largest, it, it's literally like one of the top five, I think yeah. largest eruptions in Earth's history in Indonesia. Like, like super Kota. volcano. Yeah. Like just I, this the, was a the super world volcano. is ending. Yeah. And they think it caused a population bottleneck of only 10,000 breeding individuals of modern humans to have lived, which yeah. means every single one of us is descended from that group of 10,000 people. I know. However, we're, so, we're so close to related, right, it's almost awkward. Right? <laughs> However, yeah. this is controversial because Very in controversial. Indonesia, the archaeological record does not support this. Ooh, because tell me more. there are tools and other archaeological finds that are at that period and after that period. So even right next to the volcano, the populations were not affected enough to Ooh. go there. Now, you'd think that right next to the super volcano, that's kind of what they're saying. You'd think, and that's what they're saying. But to me, I would assume that the climatic effects would be even more harsh, possibly elsewhere. And that's more mm -hmm. what the effects are that we're observing. But yeah. who knows? But so yeah. this story is from 900,000 years ago. We are so, way older. Way cool. older. We're talking almost a million years ago. We're not talking modern Homo sapiens anymore. We're talking about potentially Homo erectus um, or another species. And what happened is we're not necessarily sure. Most likely some sort of climactic shift. Yeah. But the breeding population actually dropped to only 1,300 reproducing individuals, the genetics show. That is 1,300. So tight. That is yeah. less than my high school graduating class. Oof. That, that is a very, that's not a lot of diversity at all left no, in the population. It's it's no, not. no. Now, of course, as I mentioned with the Toba hypothesis, there's a lot of issues with this that scientists are finding, but there's a lot of support for it as well, such as. Um, from the Natural History Museum of London is very behind this. A lot of other labs are behind this. Yeah. Um, a few scientists have issues because, again, they're finding in the genetics, they're just not seeing this. They're finding... I'm not really sure what they're finding that is um, against it from what I read, but... Yeah, I, I was going to say, I dug into a little bit into the reasons yeah. to try and understand. Yeah. Do you want me to fill you in on kind of what yes, I was... Okay. please do. Yeah, okay, yeah, because I mean, so again, I I dabble in genetics because I'm interested in paleogenetics from the point of view of, like, can it help us to better understand who the individual artists were? So that's totally my bias as I'm coming at it from the question of that. Um, but one of the things I've always found so fascinating about the idea of paleogenetics is that because mutation rates happen at fairly regular predictable intervals, and so this is like changes that take place in our genetic material, that doesn't necessarily, it's not good or bad, it's just a change that takes place, but we can track those. And so I've been intrigued too with the possibilities from a paleo art point of view of could we also use some of these, you know, paleogenetic 
like if we can get any sort of intact stuff, can we use it to help age bracket the art? So this is kind of where I've come at it from is what mutations have happened, which ones have not happened yet, in which case we can take yeah. a guesstimate of how old something is. Um, so I, That's a good I think, way. yeah, and, and genetics is just so interesting on so many levels because it also gives us like, potential pathways that people came out of your like came out of africa and how they were moving around the planet and because we can follow genetic waves of individuals and then we know that ideas and culture move with people right so from my point of view i see genetics as being like that and the dating methods are probably two of the most foundational important 21st century additions to our field i would say like those are the things that are really making big differences um the raman spectrometry i think is pretty cool too but so don't leave that out but i think in this case when i was looking at it yeah i was trying to understand what what did they like about it what did they not so i think the big thing is is that so first of all they actually built like a whole new calculation method for mutations is really neat and what i like about the study is the folks who did the study have now made their new calculator like actually accessible so other people could try using that's it that's right i did read that part yes and i love that because that's how good science gets done Absolutely. right like Open so access important and sharing data yep. yeah and then also the people go. you know right and also with science Which the idea is, yeah. is things have to be can you replicate the study right? Like, is it something that just only worked for you? Or, or is it because science needs to be neutral, right? So I'm really pleased that they've made that available. It means other people can now test this. Which yeah. I do find ironic, because the paper is not open access. <laughs> I know, I know, but at least at least their methods are. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's so funny, hey? Um, but yeah, so I think two, the two objections that I heard, one of them was the, the genetic signal of this bottlenecking down to this tiny group of individuals was more pronounced in the African populations than it was in the non-Africans. So mm. for, like, just to give a little background, they used 40 different sort of genetic lineages, and then they tracked them all back um, looking for the common points. So what they can do is, like, basically, once two groups separate, they're not, the chances of them having the same mutation randomly happen is unlikely. Right. So they're off, they're going to go off and have their own mutations, basically. And so you can sort of be like, when was the last common mutation? And that, again, gives you a bit of a sense of age, gives you a bit of a sense of relatedness. So they were able to track these populations back to different points of connection, and then kind of go back from there. And so what they were saying was the African populations seem to have a stronger signal. And so that's really interesting, because I think one thing that's important to remember is that there's always genetic data that's buried in, like, the nuclear DNA, but may not mm -hmm. be as obvious in the the Y chromosomes or the mitochondria, which comes from the mom, right? right. Like, so right. There's also the nuclear DNA, but say, for instance your it depends on like if if your if your mom only has boys that mitochondrial dna line is now dead in the sense that those boys children will inherit the mitochondria from the mom their future mom so that woman's mitochondria dna dies with those boys basically because if she doesn't have if she doesn't have a daughter, there is no continuous female line going on. And so what you can get, though, is her genetic signal might still be floating around in there, but we no longer have her as an individual. So that's like when they talk about, like, even Adam going back. It's not that there wasn't other people left. These are the last unbroken lines we have is probably almost right, the right, you think of it. Right. Yeah, so that's just... Not a chondrial Eve, everyone, not... Them. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> they, they sort of, oh, yeah, pardon me. Yeah, yeah, from a genetic <laughs> point of view, we should point that out. This is not the biblical version. Um, but yeah, so that it's more about unbroken lines. And so if the lines get broken, we lose that data. Like that mitochondrial right. profile is gone from our records. So this, just to keep that in mind. So what they were pointing out was it's stronger in some of the African populations. We don't know why yet. And so this is why they were saying, it's more that they were saying really cool study, but we think more needs to be done, which is pretty common for studies like this. And then the other objection I saw to it, wasn't even an objection again, but it was more, they were like, well, we feel like we still have quite a bit of archaeology 
and skeletal remains like that they weren't seeing in the record a climatic shift right, or, right, or a glaciation right. or some big event like a super volcano um, that could have that at the moment is the culprit for this. Um, right. Now, again, I mean, it could be something completely different. Like there could have been some sort of plague that basically, like, yeah, yeah we, we don't absolutely. know, right? Like, which would not, we wouldn't have that necessarily in the genes. Um, and you wouldn't even necessarily have that in bones. Like it might be a soft tissue. Like, so this is where, again, we're, we're always, we're just rebuilding off these tiny little bits. Yeah. So, but everybody seemed to think it was a cool study. I got the overall yeah. impression. People thought yeah. it was pretty awesome. Some of the folks who were involved in this were also involved in doing a massive, really fascinating genetic sort of rebuilding of the lineages in Europe a few years ago. So mm -hmm. um, some of the uh, Chinese researchers who were involved in this were like involved with that study too. So like really legit stuff. It's just, it's new. They, they, they were, they picked certain genes that they thought were more stable too. So they picked right. certain, they, so they didn't, pick, okay. they didn't use the whole thing. Right. So again, what if we looked at these other things like that's always, but that's what future studies are for. Um, right. But right. I, I think there's some interesting clues there though. And to me, I was instantly, I don't know about you, but I was like, Ooh, who is it? <laughs> now I want to know what species is it? Um, so, you know, that's always what fascinates me is who are we even talking about 900,000 right. years ago? Right. Which that's always part to me is, is, such a fascinating question, right? Is that is this the common ancestor? Obviously, they, they, are, they are our ancestor if right. if they're in our lineage. They did note that it would be highly plausible that whoever came out of yep. the bottleneck yep. was the common ancestor of Neanderthals and modern. Yeah, yeah, which is super cool. So yeah, yeah and again, some of the. So the term when you lose genetic diversity and then, you know, you, you almost end up with this little population that probably has certain characteristics really strongly and lost others is what they call genetic drift, right? That's the right name for it. When it's sort of, we've drifted off in a certain direction. So if we've lost a lot of variety, we're probably left with a, a drifting smaller population, I think. Hey, so, um, cause I was thinking, of, are you looking it up right now? I am real quick because I just want you know to make sure Let's everyone make sure is we're being right. Absolutely well informed. Yep. No. No. We don't want any incorrect okay. information. So, a genetic drift is variation in the relative frequency of different genotypes in a small population, owing yep. to the chance of disappearance of a particular gene as individuals die or do not reproduce. Yeah. So that's probably what. We we may have seen some certainly we lost a lot of diversity is kind of what they're right. saying yeah and so we we probably had a more it's it's fascinating to think like were they all living near each other like I didn't have a you know there's so much we don't know like is this all from because we don't even know where these people were located in space <laughs> right like, where, where were they were they somewhere in Africa which part of Africa like it's it's such a fascinating because. Genes, like genetics gives us so much information, but also leaves so many question marks at the same time, hey? Absolutely. But as with every other aspect of paleoanthropology... That's what makes it fun! That's what makes it fun. <laughs> that's what makes it fun. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and who knows what we'll find next week? Like, like that's what I mean, is I love and, it. Like, you know, it blows my mind every week. You were talking about, you know, the X and Y chromosome and MT and DNA yep. and everything. And a perfect story for next week that we'll give a little hint on because I think it's going to be included because I forgot to mention it for this week. Yeah. We just reconstructed the Y chromosome. Did you see oh, that? Dang, no, I the didn't. The full Y chromosome what? has been fully reconstructed. Oh, which that's means magnificent. the entire human genome is now complete. Like the whole thing. Oh, wow. Oh, I feel like we almost need to have like a little genome party next week. Okay. Right. Or our party hats. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we'll need to talk about that yeah yeah totally yeah have some sort of double helix party whoop, whoop. Um, <laughs> yes <laughs> that is so cool yes please let's definitely plan to talk about that it's because like, genetics are always welcome on our show absolutely <laughs> this is what's got to do with humans it's anthropology I know. yeah right i know it's perfect so no that's awesome amazing stories as always I can't yes. believe it's over, but I, I, I know, feel like I we've, we've covered some good ground. So, and, and thanks to all of you for hanging in there with us while we got pretty darn technical this week too. On so I know, I feel like this might have been our longest episode yet, and yeah. I think that's okay. 
I think I it think needed to be like it. Yeah. to try and do yeah. justice. Yeah, and if and if anybody has any questions or like wants clarification on something, ask. Absolutely. Obviously, we like to we talk are here about to it. Help. Yeah, we're here to help. <laughs> we'll look things up, and, and if we got anything <laughs> wrong, like we'll make sure we flag that for you. You know, I mean, Absolutely. that's the thing is that I mean that's what this is about, right? Is that we're subject matter experts, but we're still learning all the time ourselves too, right? Yes. Completely. Yes. <laughs> and with that, everyone, I think it's time that we sign off. Because, well, you can't listen to this forever, unfortunately. Exactly. But we'll be back. Yes, we'll be back next week. All right, guys. Until (laughs) then, enjoy listening to all the other episodes. And, you know, if you feel like it, spread it around. It doesn't hurt. Exactly. Share with your friends. (laughs) All right. Sharing is caring. All right, guys. Talk to you later.